Welcome everyone to this tutorial of UMAT section 2. Just before we start, yeah, if you need any resources, notes or mock interviews, or if you have any questions about medicine, UMAT or interviews, then please get in touch via the address at the bottom of the screen. So as you may know, section 2 questions deal with your emotional intelligence. So what they're aiming to do is see how well you can understand and interpret the experiences and emotions of other people. Now the way they do this is by giving you usually an excerpt from a book or sometimes a play and then asking you some questions about the interactions that you observe there. Now whereas with section 1 and 3 you can categorize the questions based on uh, their nature and their style, with section 2 the questions are all fairly similar. There are slight variations in that you know some might be in a medical context and some might not be or some might be written in first person and some in third but your approach to all section 2 questions should be pretty much the same. So this video will be a bit different from my others in that I'll just give you a whole load of tips at the start and then we'll do all the questions at the end because um, the approach is, is pretty much the same throughout. So on to the different tips you can take into all section 2 questions and the top one there is about your mindset. Now back in the day when UMAP was broken into different sections uh, we were encouraged to get into a really happy, positive and empathetic mindset just prior to starting section 2. Now. Uh, obviously now that they've mixed up all the sections together, that's not quite so easy. But I would still encourage you, every time you're doing a section 2 question, to just be as open-minded and non-judgmental as possible. So really you want to be thinking the best of all the characters in that excerpt. Um, and you want to be sort of trying to, to look at it in the most positive way possible. Because the tone of your answer does to some extent reflect you and your personality. The second point there is just about how you approach each question. So most people would probably begin by reading the passage itself, and then once they finish that, go on to the questions. Uh, but a, a possible method you could use is to begin by reading the question stem, or, so which is the question itself, and then going back and reading the passage afterwards. Now the idea of this method is that by reading the question first, you know what to focus on. Uh, and you know if any of the passage is a bit superfluous to what you're, what you're answering. Um, and it helps sort of focus your attention to the most important bits. So you may feel that that's a better approach than just going straight through. Um, but either way, just, just, you know, try both and then see which works best for you. Uh, and the final point is just about, um, sort of the mindset again, you need to be in when you're reading the passage itself. So just a, a general tip about trying to block out the pressures of the day and of the situation and trying to lose yourself in the text as you would a good book. So, you know, try to picture the scenarios which I presented to you as you're reading through it and maybe even try to place yourself in the situation to help you better um, understand the emotions and the experiences going on. Now onto the second page of tips and that top point there is uh, mostly for the people who approach section 2 questions by reading the passage first followed by the question. So if you read the passage first and then the question, uh, usually, unless you're very sure, but usually it's best to go and reread the bit of the passage which the question relates to. So uh, this is just so you can put the, the question back into context uh, and so to remind yourself of the specifics of uh, the bit of the passage which the question is dealing with. So often best to go passage, question, and then back to the small part of the passage to which the question relates. Now that second point is actually quite interesting because the way the correct answer is chosen for UMAT section 2 questions is that the, um, the exam, or at least you know, parts of the exam, is given to a bunch of sort of uh, adults, sort of a good cross-section of society, uh, people who have had different life experiences, and they're asked to respond to those questions. Uh, and the correct answer is simply the one which is chosen the majority of the time. So. The second point there is saying that if you read a section 2 question and your, your gut reaction is you know, pulling you strongly towards one option, um, you should go for it. Because that's sort of how the correct answer is selected in the first place. It's just uh, you know, it's people's gut feeling. So if you feel strongly towards one answer, then it's probably not a trap. Just go for it, fill it in, and move on to the next question. Um, but if you're not absolutely sure about one option, if there's you know, two or three which you're, you're tossing up between, then at that point you sort of 
should put aside your gut reaction and begin to look at them more critically. So the idea is that you should uh, look at each answer not for whether it's right, because they're probably right to some extent, all of them, but look at them for how wrong they are. So it is looking very critically at them, uh, which is the basis of the next few slides, is you know differentiating between options based on, uh, like it says here, their strength, their tone, and their connotations. So following on from the slide before, uh, two of the, the best ways of differentiating between two different or two or more different uh, multiple choice options is by comparing their strength or comparing their connotations. So in essence what you're doing is you're working out the, the strength of the passage or the connotations of the passage and finding the answer which best matches that. So if we just look at the top one here about strength, so for example, the word cheerful is not as strong as the word euphoric. So if you had two multiple choice options, one of which was cheerful and one of which was euphoric, you would then sort of try and base, uh, you choose between those two based on the strength of the passage. And similarly, the second point there about uh, connotations. So words which are supposedly very similar uh, can often have slightly different meanings or can be used in slightly different settings. So for example, the word miserable or the word miserable and upset seem pretty similar, um, but they do have slightly different connotations. So I would say when compared to upset, the word miserable is uh, suggests slightly less power, a more resigned state and greater feelings of despondency. So if you're differentiating between two answers based on key phrases and words, then think about the connotations of those key phrases and words in doing so. And following on from what I just mentioned there, um, I'll just show you these, these models. They're called circumflex models of emotion. Uh, the most famous one, or at least the first one, was done by a bloke called uh, James Russell from memory. It's called Russell's model of circumflex. And all it, all it is is two axes. Uh, on the horizontal axis, it goes from unpleasant to pleasant, or you know, bad to good, or sad to happy. And on the vertical axis, it goes from uh, strong, or intense, down to mild, or pretty weak. So then the different emotions and the different words are plotted around this based on uh, their position on the two axes. So I, this is not to, you shouldn't learn this, this is not to rote learn, it's just for reference um, so that you can sort of appreciate how to differentiate between words based on their strength and their connotations. Uh, and now onto the second last big point, and this is about your vocabulary. So occasionally, uh, Acer will throw in a few really used words, a few unusual words in section two, usually an emotive word or an adjective. So, I mean, here are a few examples down here about the different uh, of the different words they could throw at you, um, and I'll, I'll put in the description box links to pages which show you kind of uh, more detailed lists. Um, so I would say that this isn't the most important part of your preparation because there'll probably only be two or three words in there that you don't really know. So there's more important things to focus on. Um, but if you've got a bit of spare time, then uh, it could be good to just scan through that list and see what you don't know and improve on that. And just finally, if you're completely stuck, if you have no idea which option is right, uh, or if you're running out of time and you have to fill in uh, options pretty quickly, then go for the multiple choice option, which is the longest often because often the most detailed answer will be the one which is correct so that's that's the last resort really but it, it's a good tip to have so let's go on to doing a few questions just to help you apply and consolidate those points so this is a typical section two question we've got here uh, the passage followed by the question at the bottom um, if you can't read that if it's a bit small or, or blurry uh, then maybe try under the video in the description box um, but yeah, but that's the two main parts of it, the passage and the question. Normally you might uh, also get a bit of context before the passage. So that'll just be one or two lines giving background into the nature of this scene. So in this case, the context would be that Dion, who is the main character, is a doctor from Melbourne, who has travelled back to South Africa to be with his father, called Hendrik, who 
has had some problems with his heart recently, uh, which means he's hospitalized with a poor prognosis. Uh, and then you go from there with the passage. So I'll, I'll give you a few seconds now just to pause the video and have a go at the question. So now, looking at the question, it says, Dion's feelings in this scene could best be described as... Um, so option A is apathetic. Now, apathetic means to be indifferent or to not really care what's, what's going on. So in this case, that's very obviously not true because he clearly loves his father very much and cares for his well-being. So I think the only way you could choose option A is if you didn't know what that word meant. Um, so this is where the vocab comes into it a bit. Uh, but option A is wrong. Option B, somba, which is means sort of uh, generally sort of sad and upset and depressed, um, sort of a broad term for that, uh, and that seems like a pretty good fit in this case. Option C is determined, which is quite a good fit, because I'm sure he is determined that his father can get through it and to, to stay there and help support him. But in this particular scene, it it seems like he's sort of uh, quite downtrodden and quite uh, lost. So determined isn't really coming through that strongly in this particular scene. And option D, wistful, that sort of means to be quite pensive and thoughtful. Um, sometimes in a sad way, but often not. So again, it's not really that relevant. So option B. So often when uh, the passage is quite extensive, they'll give you a few questions based off that passage. So in this case, here's a second question based off the passage about Dion and his father. Uh, and again, I'll give you a few seconds now just to pause the video and have a go at it. Okay, so the question deals with um, the sentence at the top here in the top paragraph about how uh, translucent cords clutch to the contours of the old man's body streaming down from an intravenous strip. So even though the question is just dealing with uh, that particular sentence, it's important to consider that sentence in the context of the whole excerpt. Uh, or the whole passage. Um, yeah, so just with that in mind, uh, let's go through each option one by one. So option A says, Dion perceives his father as looking thin and emaciated. So emaciated just means to be thin and weak. So yeah, that's one example of where vocab again might become important. Um, so as for the option as a whole, uh, I'd say there isn't really anything in that sentence which would suggest that he looks thin and emaciated. Possibly you could say the contours of his body would suggest a sort of an image of him being very, you know, gaunt and, and skinny and having, um, you know, very pronounced um, features. But again, this is sort of, I think, drawing a bit too long a bow and sort of making you make too many assumptions. So I'd say not, not A. Uh, as for B, um, I think that's too literal an interpretation of that sentence. Because yes, obviously he is attached to equipment, um, you know, an IV drip and, and cords. Uh, but I think they want you to go further than that in this case. They want you to um, to look beyond that to the deeper meaning. So option C looks pretty good. Um, first part says he still loves his father, which is pretty obvious from the strength of his emotions uh, throughout. It says that he's. His father's in a fragile and hospitalized state, which is again pretty obvious throughout. Um, and then it says that the image Dion has of his father is different from the reality at the moment. It's different from the man who's sitting in the bed across from him. And I think that's sort of highlighted here in the fact that he refers to his dad as the old man, the old man's body. It's sort of suggesting a, a degree of separation because he appears so different from normal. So option C is pretty good. And option D, um, that Dion no longer feels a connection to his father, seeing him simply as an old man. Um, I'd say that, that that sort of, again, takes the statement about him observing the contours of the old man's body a bit too literally. So I think the old man statement is showing that he sees his father as his father, but he appears a bit different from normal. So there's that you know, degree of of separation. He doesn't see him as his father. He sees him as um, appearing as someone a bit different, even though he knows that he's his father and he still loves him for that. So that, that final option there, option D, um, I mean, very obviously he does still feel a connection to his father given 
the strength of the emotion in the passage. So that's not true. And he, you know, again, obviously, he sees him as much more than just an old man, even though that's how he refers to him. So yeah, overall, I'd say option C. So here's another question for you. Um, the context of this is quite complicated, and on the day of the unit, you won't need to know anything about politics or history or anything like that. Um, just to give a bit of background, this is in Hungary in 1956, and it deals with the conflicting views as to whether or not to follow and to give in to Soviet rule, which is the basis of um, which was the basis of a series of revolts amongst students and other people. So that's not too important, but um, just have a read of the question, and I'll give you a few seconds now to pause the video and have a go at it if you want. So onto the question itself, and this one is referring to this line here, the second last sentence about how Boric opted against continuing the debate against his friends, and it's asking why he did that. So again, just go through each option one by one. And option A looks pretty good. Uh, it suggests that he decided that um, winning a debate was not worth potentially losing some friends, given uh, the fact that there were only a few people you know, still willing to be uh, seen with him. And this bit here about how uh, you know, he, he felt that it wasn't worth losing uh, one of the few friends he had left is kind of mentioned here at the top about how uh, Edvard and George were two of the last students willing to be seen with him. So that supports the first part of option A. Um, and it's saying that he, he would normally debate, but he just feels that it's not worth it because of this potential loss. So option A is pretty good. Uh, looking at option B, there's nothing really to suggest in the passage that he is shy by nature. Um, and in fact, over here where it says uh, or, or where he mentions that he feels the radio station is concentrated propaganda, shows that he is actually quite happy to put forward his opinion and, and, uh, and rise to confrontation. So B isn't right. Um, as for C, again, the conviction with which he states this line about how, um, you know, what's the point the radio station is propaganda, suggests that he, he does hold pretty strong beliefs. Um, and that it's probably not George and Edvard's comments that ultimately stop him from doing that. And as for D, uh, again, there's nothing really to suggest that um, that he doesn't know much about the political situation at the time. Um, and there's nothing preceding his decision to stop debating, which would suggest that he feels uh, that they know more about it than he does. So, I mean, that you know, it could be right, but you'd have to read too much into it for it to be definitely right. So option A is the best of the four. So now onto a different question. And this one is set in Australia in the 50s. Uh, and the main protagonist is uh, Jara, who is a 12-year-old boy. Uh, and the story here is that he was a victim of the stolen generations. So he's indigenous and was taken from his parents about three years prior to this scene occurring. Uh, during which time he'd been sort of adopted by a white family and being sort of anglicised uh, over that time. So again, have a read of that and pause the video and have a, have a go at answering if you want. So the question is referring to this line here about how a twisted smile manifested itself upon the teacher's face. And the question is asking, why did this happen? So again, just going through options, uh, option A. The teacher took joy from taunting Jarrah about his past and, and culture. Um, this is a pretty good option because if you look at the lead up to this, the statement here about the twisted smile, um, it, it basically involves the teacher uh, asking questions and making comments on the book of Huckleberry Finn, but using that book as a metaphor for Jarrah's own life. So that's sort of the trick to this question, is to realise that uh, the book is just sort of is mirroring um, Jarrah's own life, and so the teacher is making comment on the book to sort of indirectly make comment on Jarrah's life. So, given that the, the statements before the smile include uh, whether or not it's a good thing to, you know, anglicise him and, and provide him with manners and education, I would say that the teacher is taunting Jarrah about his past and his roots. So, option A is pretty good. 
As for the other options, uh, B. Again, um, in remembering that the book is a metaphor for Jared's life, we could possibly say that the teacher is smiling because he's kind of, uh, rev you know, reveling in his own, um, you know, intelligence and wit in comparing the two. But, you can, I mean, it doesn't seem like that's the main source of the smile. It's not the main reason why he's smiling in such a, a twisted and, and sinister way. So option B is not a bad option, but probably not quite as good as option A in my opinion. Uh, option C um, is not correct because it's a twisted smile. It's not genuine. It's you know a very different uh, meaning behind the smile. And option D, um, a slightly better option than option C, but not by much. Um, I think it's too much of a stretch to sort of uh, assume this. And in any case, option A and even option B are probably a better, a better overall statement. So all in all, I'd say option A is probably the best. So on to another question based off the stimulus about JAR. And I'll give you a few seconds now again just to pause the video and have a go at it. Okay. So it seems like a fairly simple question, uh, fairly simple to understand, but uh, the difficulty comes because some of these words are pretty similar to one another, and you need to differentiate between them based on the nature of the stimulus. So we'll just go through one, one by one again. So uh, A, which is sullen. So sullen means to be a bit, a bit sulky, a bit sort of, uh, you know, mildly bad tempered. And in this case, I think that wouldn't be correct because. Jarrah sort of responds in a very calm manner. He doesn't, uh, he, he's not provoked. So I think it, it wouldn't be fair to say he's sulky in any way. There's certainly no description of it. Uh, option B, irritable. That again means to be sort of quite angry and on edge and, and easily provoked. Um, and again, because he's so calm and he hasn't been provoked, I'd say that's not the most accurate statement. Option C, which is bitter. That's probably closer to, to the, the real answer. Um, certainly you'd think that, that after this exchange where he has to behave and, and bite his tongue despite copying such abuse, he would be very bitter towards the teacher, you'd imagine. So that's a pretty good answer. But I think D is probably the best because the strength of seething is just a bit more than bitter. Um, and it, it really does encapsulate how he probably feel at having had to, to sit there and endure this. Um, so I think, based on the strength of it, D is better than C, and D would be correct. So, on to a different type of question now, and this is a first-person account of a medical or a medical-related uh, incident. So, I'll give you a few seconds just to pause the video and have a go at it. So, the question deals with the author's opinion of the psychologist and uh, particularly with reference to the psychologist's feedback after the exam. So that's dealing with this bit here about how the psychologist says he'll grow out of it. That's really the crux of this question as I see it. So the question is saying that statement, what does that show about the psychologist? Uh, option A says a lack of sensitivity to the patient's feelings is shown and I think that's probably true because it, it makes it sound as though this condition, which isn't necessarily uh, a bad thing, and certainly something they can't help, is being treated like a like a, a developmental problem. So option A is pretty good. Uh, option B is sort of, in a sense, the opposite of that, or, or fairly opposed to that, because it's saying that the psychologist understands and is sensitive to the patient's feelings. And the fact that he made that statement suggested in fact isn't. Option C suggests that the psychologist is uh, interested in the patient's circumstances. Uh, and while it does sort of mention that he, he um, that the psychologist was pleasant and engaging and made him feel quite comfortable, there's nothing really suggesting that he has a genuine interest in the patient's circumstances. And again, this sentence, which I, you know, I maintain is the crux of the, the question, sort of goes against uh, the idea that the psychologist had a genuine interest in the patient's circumstances and backgrounds is it's quite dismissive. Just, you know, he'll grow out of it. So probably not option C. 
uh, and option D, a natural ability to make the patient feel comfortable. Again, it's mentioned here that he did make um, the, the author feel quite comfortable, but I don't think that's the overriding uh, message from the, from the text. And certainly if you look at the question, the question is dealing with the feedback after the exam results. So it's dealing with this bit here. Um, so if you have a question which focuses on a, a specific part of the text, you know, and in this case, you know, the lower half of the text, then, you know, to, to pick an option which deals with something in the top half is probably not the best option. So all in all, the fact that that's pretty, pretty insensitive, that comment, uh, would make me go for option A. And final question now, and this one is just another slight variation on the medical uh, scenario. So this is just uh, pure dialogue. So you can see down the left here, it's doctor, mother, doctor, mother, going back and forth. So there's no description, it's just dialogue. Um, so again, uh, just pause the video now if you want to have a go at that. So this question deals with number six here, uh, six, the sixth part of the dialogue, which is the mother's question of what would you do? So this question is probably one of the more difficult ones of this presentation, because I reckon there's about uh, three of the four options which are, are feasible. So let's just go through one by one. Uh, option A is avoid making the decision. So we have to ask ourselves whether we think this statement is our attempt to avoid making the decision. Uh, and it could feasibly be that, I think. But I would say that, I mean, if you look at the passage as a whole, then up here we have a statement where the doctor says that uh, the mother needs to make the decision very soon. And the mother responds with, I know, I know, but, uh, you know, this isn't a, a decision you can make straight away. So it seems like she understands that she has to make a decision, and that's not the problem. She's accepted that, um, so maybe not option A, because that goes against that, that idea. So going down, uh, option B, seek advice. Uh, this looks like a pretty good option on the face of it, because it's very general, um, and that, that, you know, the question, what would you do, is obviously uh, one which could easily what be used to seek advice. So it's difficult to find a fault with that. You know, it's difficult to see how that could be seen to be wrong. Uh, option C. There's nothing really in the in the passage to suggest that the uh, the mother doesn't think that highly of the doctor. Um, you know, she doesn't try to undermine him. She doesn't question his authority. So it doesn't seem to be a matter of of his ignorance. Um, you know, she, she seems to respect his opinion. Uh, and option D could be could be correct, definitely feasible. Um, I reckon it's probably a toss-up between option B and option D. Uh, maybe you could just say that with option D, given she's so open and forthright, um, she'd probably find a more direct way of, of um, highlighting the difficulty of her choice than doing so through a rather indirect statement like, what would you do? So all in all, I'd probably lean towards B, given, you, you know, you can't really find, uh, find fault with it. So all in all, option B. So that's about it. Uh, again, if you like any resources, if you have any questions, or if you want any private tutoring, then please get in touch by that email address. Uh, otherwise, that's it. Um, I sense this has been a pretty short video relative to the other ones, but uh, there really isn't that much to know for section two. So if you can get your head around all this, uh, then you should be you should be fine. So I wish you all the best.